Chad is one of the few that's known in the state for really having that success story, and, and uh, he's going to share about it today. So here you go. Thank you, Matt. So, you know, Rice Lake is a hotbed of innovation, obviously. I mean, Jake, I, you know, by the way, Microsoft started in Rice Lake, of course. Um, be funny. No, it, it, you know, it's really, quite frankly, and Jake kind of alluded to this, um, well, you indicated. Um, so, Natasha Plank, the name that was said earlier, um, she was the one that really got, gave us the insight. And uh, uh, just to give a little backstory, if Jake was here, I'd probably pick on him a little more. But um, so I started back in 2000. Well, actually, why don't we? Well, I'll, this is my information. There you go. Um, I was 24 years in Rice Lake schools, retired a year and a half, a year ago, a little over a year ago, and basically beca became the executive director of a cooperative of which um, is really continuing to do what we're doing now, what we, what we accomplish in Rice Lake. So um, I need the clicker. Where is that thing? That'd be a good idea. All right. Now I got to push down, right? There we go. So I'm going to, and I'll, I'll get into some of this when I get into this next uh, next slide, but summary, basically we're looking at summary of the approach, um, the financial results. I like to put those up first because it tends to get people to pay attention a little bit for at least five minutes. Um, and then how we, you know, how we got here um, and then the evolution into what kind of became a cooperative. So, um, you know, just for summary and, and obviously the, the recipe is very similar to mo most of these plans of what, what you have to do, you know, self-funded plan, on-site clinic. I, I think that's quite frankly, a very, it, it, almost pretty hard to not to accomplish it well without it. Let's just say that. A, a cl either an on-site clinic or at least an independent D, um, DPC kind of situation, independent provider. Um, our own direct contract. So we actually, I actually, was driving around to Minneapolis and around Rice Lake and Eau Claire and wherever trying to get agreements so that we could accomplish what we were trying to do. Um, by the way, I shouldn't be a contractor. I, we did hire someone that actually knows how to do it now. Um, and then uh, basically we had our own health system contracts. That's where, where Jake and I diverged. Um, and um, we actually had reference-based pricing on the backside and still do with the Rice Lake plan. Um, we had really no, we, we didn't have a PPO network. There was no network. We were completely direct with everything we were doing. So, whoops, and then there's the button thing. All right, um, so here's the results. Um, and this is actual, it, it, the, the results are um, actual claims paid. So it's not like, you know, it's not recalculating with an IBR. It's just actually what was paid in that year. So 16, 17 was our base year. Um, and so what happened basically in our base year, we had a premium spend of, of just, just under $4 million. That was what the premium was supposed to be or was. And we had an actual spend, at least according to the insurance company, we spent 4.25 roughly. So we were running hot. Um, and then, so then we had, a, we, we had a renewal that was gonna happen, obviously that was gonna be pretty bad, we knew that. Um, and actually the year prior to that in 15, 16, um, we had had a projected renewal of about a 30% increase. And we, and we said, well, we really can't handle that. Thankfully, had a rate lock, and I look at Jake's rate lock, and I'm like, wow, that's a crappy rate lock at 29%. We were 9%. Um, I didn't realize he had that. Um, but um, so we came in and like, okay, we had a year to kind of figure this out. Um, so, and you can kind of see what happened with our plan. So this is trend at 4%, which is, I think, unrealistic. It's going to be more than that. This is what our plan actually did. So we, were, we had a renewal. It was going to be $1.1 million dollars up from there. Now, obviously those numbers aren't $1.1 million difference. It's because some of our people, when we change what we were doing, kind of go, oh, we're out of here. And they went to their spouse's plan, right? Because it, it was definitely different. So we had some people drop off the plan, but if you look at the results, for almost you know, 4.75, we spent 2.5 that year when we changed what we did. And that's, these are real numbers. Um, and then continuing through, you know, again, projected trend going out, you know, we stayed pretty flat. You look at that pretty amazing how flat we stayed over a quite a long period of time. Um, and then last year, uh, you know, we had a, what I would call a bad year, and that bad year was um, the actual we were working with um, looked, basically looked at, and, and has seen this, I think, in some, some other group's data, but he thinks it's like a COVID bounce kind of situation where you had, you know, people that didn't get care after COVID or through COVID 
And then, you know, the cancer that was stage two becomes stage four. You know, the things that didn't happen because people weren't getting the care they should have gotten, that was kind of his, he said he's kind of seen that in the data. Maybe that's not true. It's, it's not a empirical. It's just his opinion. But um, so that was kind of how our plan flowed. Where We've really had, I, I think, pretty exceptional results. And honestly, um, the reason for that is, I, I should say, the, the benefit to the school district obviously is enormous. We, we would have been cutting... 20, 25 people, um, and, and, uh, and I think of it as the value that we put back into the school system and keeping teachers in classrooms, educating our kids, making sure that they get what they deserve as opposed to funding a system that really adds no value to us. Obviously, healthcare adds value to our people, but it's just extracting value out of what we're trying to deliver to kids. So, and then this point down here is just that current trend we're trending at um, right now for the last eight months, looking out, it's at 3.7. So we had really a bad six months in, in that last year here. And then basically going forward, we're kind of back on trend. So that kind of tells me, you know, every, they say every three, five, seven years, whatever, you have a bad year. Hopefully that's just what it is. Okay, so this is kind of the timeline of what we went through, and I'm, now I'm gonna explain this. So Act 10, if anyone, Probably some of you know what that is, but Act 10 was a, basically uh, Scott Walker, the governor, said, hey, we're no longer going to have public sector unions. That was really the, the, the point in which a school district could even consider doing this. So prior to that, unions effectively, I, for lack of a, <laughs> you couldn't barely wipe your nose without having the union approve it back then, you know, prior to that. So there wasn't going to be any ability for a school district to do what we've done back then. So Act 10 kind of takes place. What they did is they took a million dollars out of Rice Lake schools at the time, because so, they were trying to balance a budget, so they pulled a million dollars out of, school, out of Rice Lake, and all the other schools out there had proportionally significant reductions, and then said, okay, but we'll give you tools. And the tools were go and basically you know, change your health plan. Now, personally, you know, I'm a school guy, and you'd think, well, I, that's terrible. No, I, I believe it was actually a productive thing at the time. Um, and, and what I mean by that is th the balance was just off. You know, there, if you can't make any changes in your health plan, if you can't do anything, you're really not serving the taxpayer. You're just perpetuating basically bad behavior, in my opinion. So, so when that change happened, it really forced us to change our health plan. So then suddenly we had a no deductible, no copay, 95% pay plan. That was the Rice Lake Schools. And in, uh, I think it was in 2006, one of my friends at Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, when we were, I think when we flipped over to them, you know, we, I played the flip back and forth game between you know, insurance companies to try to keep things under, under the, you know, keep it down, the cost down. And uh, she's quoting our, they're quoting our plan and she's looking at it and she goes, I don't have a plan anywhere that's this rich. I mean, I don't know. How, she was blown away. So we, in Blue Cross, at that time, she said, in Blue Cross, Blue Shield, they did not have a plan as rich as ours. I, maybe that's true. I, it's shocking, but yeah, it was, it was pretty rich. So ultimately, then we're, okay, now, now we have the, really almost forced to change our plan. So then deductible coinsurances came in play. So we got, I think it was a $1,503,000 deductible with $500 coinsurance. So a 2-4, you know, kind of thing um, overall. So we implement that. And you know, I personally agreed with that change because it at least created some consumer in our, consumerism in our plan. Um, but what the unintended consequences of things that happen kind of, um, well, basically what ended up happening is I had a, one of the employees come up to me and say, I am not gonna use the plan anymore. And I'm like, you gotta use the plan if you need it. You, you should get healthcare, you should be cared for. Um, and I can't afford $1,500. I can't pay that. And I'm like, well, just if you're sick, just go to someone primary care. It's not that big a deal. It's, it's you know, 150 bucks. You know, go to somebody. And they're like, I can't. You know, and she was a, a secretary at, the, at one of the schools. So that stuck in my head. You know, like, geez, that's, that's kind of rough, you know, that she's not going to actually go get care. That, that just didn't register for me. Obviously, I, didn't, I made more money. Probably didn't, you know, didn't think of it that way. So fast forward another year and a half, she dies of cancer. And I, it chokes me up every time I say it, but um, so Bryce, you know, I, Jake and I are both criers, I guess. But um, 
Um, but no, it, it chokes me up to think about that. And I was not personally in front of that person having that dialogue. And then a year and a half later, she's gone. Um, and it really made me think about, okay, yeah, I get the deductible coinsurance. And, and honestly, 1,500, 3,000, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you, that's like laughable. Um, but that decision point that the person isn't making the right choice for their health because of that. And that's where, at that point I go, I need to get a primary care clinic. I want to have a primary care clinic in my employer and, and somehow access where they can get free care. And that was kind of the trigger point. And it was about caring about our people and making sure they get at least at base level they can get in and get something done. Get something to say, yes, um, there is something wrong. You need to go somewhere. Um, and so that was the start of our, our thought process and moving towards self-funding. So we, we um, Act 10 kind of drove that. We were full, you know, we were full insured, seeking to self-fund in 1415. That was post the, pa the passing of that person. Um, 15, 2015, we implemented the clinic. Interestingly enough, Jake, Jake and I were collaborating a little bit. I was actually the first one to implement a clinic, and I'm like, Jake, come join us. Come, come join us. Let's do this together. And we had all kinds of visions. We're going to have our own hospital, you know. I mean, being funny, but you know, uh, you know, we, we had all these visions of where we might go with this, right? So. Ultimately, they decided to go out on their own and for various reasons, but they decided to do it on their own. But then he went to that Transforming Healthcare Conference that he talked about and ran into Natasha and, and Ross Biela and came back to me and said, hey, guess what? And pretty much instantly after hearing that, I went to my, my uh, broker and I said, we're doing this. And she's like, okay. And, and thankfully, we had a broker that's a really solid class act, um, Sarah Hamas, if any of you know her. She was our broker. And quite frankly, that... Um, and, and probably saying this and not saying it out of knowing it for sure, but it was probably this, it was a starting point for her to doing this, and it was a starting point for us to doing it. You know, and so we kind of grew up through that. And I and certainly she's got a wealth of experience beyond any of that, probably too. But um, but it was probably the first real experience of going through this uh, together. So projected increase. You know, we embark on the new approach. We took a year. That whole that whole basically summer of 2016 through the whole, that whole calendar, knowing we were going to get blown up. I mean, we knew we were going to have a bad renewal. Worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. It got to the point where it was May of 2017, and we're still not sure what we're going to do. And basically, our insurance committee, um, and I'll, uh, let's see if I can go down there. We're looking at this slide. So our insurance committee, so it's our staff, and I, I was a little strategic. I put some people on our committee that I knew were really rational people. I, in fact, had our, the tech guy was the one that was, was uh, the one that I really planted on our committee to make sure that people were not just making protective decisions, saying, oh, well, I, if this is what I know. I don't want to go there, you know. And, and so he was on the committee. We looked at this, this slide. This is from Ross Biella. He, he actually gave, uh, presented this to our group. So this is our data. One of the guys in the room had had the knee surgery that was on the top. By the way, he had it done, and then he had it done a year later because it was done wrong. Um, so he spent almost 200 grand on that guy's knee, and we could have done it for $26,000 if we would have done it the other way, and it would have had a warranty, and we would have had it solved. So that was our that was the aha moment for our group. And and if you think about it, we had pretty hardcore union mentality people in that room. And thankfully, I had Bill in there as well. And Bill basically, you know, they were going, well, yeah, but what about, you know, we need to be able to do what we want to do and blah, 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 and all that stuff. And we shouldn't have to go to this place or that place. We should be, who cares if it's 89,000? That's where I, my doctor wants to send me all that kind of stuff. And um, Bill said, wait a second, wait a second. We're here, the taxpayers pay our salary, basically what he said. And how can we look at that and not do the right thing? And it just shut the room down, and that was the end of the conversation, and off we went. So in May, for a July 1 renewal, we flipped the switch. May like 12th or 14th or something like that. Well, it was a fire drill, but um, yeah. So um, just going back, and so you know that kind of gives you the idea. So 17, 18 was the first time we went forward doing it. Actually, we were six months behind Jake, because Jake's a January, we're a, June, a July 1 renewal. Um, and so, you know, and I, I put this slide up here. 
uh, just, to, just to give you, an, and, and it's probably not really well placed in the thing, but basically, you know, this is talking about our experiences with when we flipped over. We started, you know, and, and this is actually a slide that Sarah put together, but, you know, this is an actual real colonoscopy that we can get consistently out in Minneapolis. This is an, a colonoscopy we had with a, in a local system that was actually $17,000 and then got... Um, and then got negotiated down with an attorney down to ten thousand dollars, <laughs> um, and so ridiculously expensive. But um, but th th this was kind of stuff. The information we were looking at as we we're going through this too. So, um, and I'm going to back up a second. Um, so as as basically here, you know, we, we started the consumer driven plan, and and really it was a very ugly start. I'll say it was really difficult. What ended up happening was. You would start something in, in July when you started to actually think about doing it in May. We didn't have any of the infrastructure to really pull this off well. And so what ended up happening was we really went out with an RBP plan, a reference-based plan with intending to have contracts but didn't. And for those of you that live especially up in our area, RBP just does not work. Um, and so, um, you know, the idea of, of the, a bill coming, you, the T, the RBP reprices it at a one, like 120% of Medicare, and Mayo and Marshfield laugh at us. You know, they go, yeah, right. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely not do that. Um, and actually, in 1718, we started the process, the first three months, all of a sudden I start, I get, we, we, uh, we get a letter from Marshfield and saying, hey, um, you know, we've got balanced bills, we're gonna, we're not gonna, you know, we're gonna have a problem with this, you know, you need to do something about your plan, is effectively what, what it said. Then we, like a week later, I get an email in my email box. <laughs> my superintendent and I both get emails saying, you need to be in our office at 10 o'clock or noon on October 7th or something like that. It was right around that time. And I go into the superintendent's office and I go, are you, did you get that email? I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I said, I'm going to respond back and say, I'm not coming until you call me and tell me why you're actually asking me to come. And what it came down to was they wanted me to come, basically come and, complained to us about how terrible our health plan was. So subsequently, after I send that email, the, the CEO of the hospital calls me in my office and says, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to send that, but I do want you to come. We did, we went there. Spent about 15, 20 minutes with them berating us about how we, you owe us. So we're taught the health system in, in Rice Lake, the, the main provider, the main system in Rice Lake is berating us about we have 800 employees in there. We pay taxes in this community. You know, all our people pay taxes, I should say. You know, the hospital obviously doesn't. Um, and, you know, you owe, you know, you owe us effectively. You, should, you, sh you need to change your plan. You need to get rid of this RBP stuff and, you know, start paying us full boat and the whole thing. And, and I'm, like, listening to him continue to complain. And my superintendent's a really, really nice guy and a really good man. I tend to get to a point where I'm, like, I'm done with this. And I'm like, he's going, he's going, and, and, and this, the uh, hospital CEO and the head of contracting for Marshall was, sitting there, Marshall was sitting in the room, and I'm sitting there, and I'm finally like, I'm done with this. And I said, um, he, he, and he's threatened to balance bill all our members and go through the whole fight, basically. And I said, you go for it. You balance bill every single one of our members. We'll fight everyone in court. And guess what? We'll be on the front page of the Rice Lake Chronicle type saying, poor little Rice Lake Area School District's getting beat up by Marshall Clinic. Do you want that? You want that? Let's go. It was, it, that was kind of, and my, my super looking at me like, shut up, Pat. Um, <laughs> but, um, I, I, you know, but that actually, that was the moment, honestly, that Marshall, because they effectively go, wait a second, that's a different calculus here. I don't know that I want to go there. And so the, the head of contracting sitting there goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, hold on here. We can figure this out. So that was the start of us really doing any significant contracting. And what ended up happening is we ended up with a deal directly with Marshfield. Um, and that was the start of having our system relationships. Um, so I'm going to cruise on. Oh, wrong way. So what we ultimately ended up building for our plan, and, and I talked about going out and getting contracts. So we had our... our health system thing now with Marshfield, and we were starting to get contracts, but we didn't have a lot, so we're really a heavy RVP plan, not a good place to do that. 
Um, and so as we got more and more direct contracts, we started putting it together and built this kind of system. And this is pretty common. Jake's is a little more complicated than ours because he has kind of, you know, he has more levels because of the way um, the alliance uh, agreements are set up. And really, by the way, Jake and I went actually, I'll say this, in 2018, I got the Transforming, Health, tra Transforming Healthcare Award from the Alliance. And then I think, is Mike in here? Oh, he must have left, fine. Okay. Okay, so we got, I got the, and I, I was never a part of the Alliance, so it's pretty classy of them to do that. But then Jake and I said, well, let's come on up here and, you know, let's try to build what I call the Alliance 2.0, you know. And ultimately what ended up happening, and, and it's just, kind of how it worked, it made more financial sense for us to not do it, and it made more financial sense for um, Jake to do it, and so we diverged at that point. So we're, our plan is a little more simplified in that we only have three tiers, but you know, the, the key to, to really making it work is obviously having a, a, a financial motivation for people to make good choices and creating that consumerism in the plan, and that's really, um, I will say that in our case, there's a lot more shock and awe because when we changed our plan, it was a mess, people were crabby, I was actually at one point, um, there was a closed session about whether I would be working there anymore. Um, and um, because I was more so the champion of, the, of what we were doing, um, and interestingly enough, about th two years later, the same board members that wanted to get rid of me, one of them pulled me aside and said, you know, Pat, thank you for your tenacity in doing this. He goes, I didn't understand it, now I do, and, and the benefits to our kids are enormous, obviously. So, Sometimes you have to bleed a little bit to get there and lead through change, right? But um, so, you know, the structure is this. You know, we have, these are direct, our direct deals with, with, um, with the providers. We don't have a PPO network again. And then we do tier, th in tier three with um, RBP. Basically, a very small percentage of everything we do goes through RBP. You know, talking about self-funding, you've already heard a lot of this stuff. So, you know, really what I, what I call it is smart self-funding rather than traditional self-funding. If you don't do it and control the levers and make it work for you, then in my mind, self-funding is of very little value or just a little bit of value. You have a chance to do better because you're going to win on the winning years and you might lose on the, you know, the losing years but, um, you know, where your, where your claims are bad. But you're really just playing with the margin as opposed to really pulling all the levers, getting all the pieces in together to make the plan work as well as it should. Um, and by the way, yes, I was told multiple times, our groups have been told, we've got a number of groups working together doing this stuff, but um, told a number of times, you know, you're not, the, you're, you're, it's not gonna work for you. This is, you know, you're not a candidate, it's just too risky. Um, and it's really because it's looking at it traditionally. Um, talk about our clinic. Open in 15, I talked about that. We've got a, a 24 hours worth of doc time, 24 hours worth of nurse time, uh, at least paid for. They're not working all that time, so it's, uh, you know, charting and so on. And nurse and MA. Um, and again, much of what you see in the previous ones where you've got a lot of different services. And, and, the, and the thing that I think probably is more important to me is the, the, level of peop, the level of care and concern and engagement from our, our providers, because they do generally look at them, it's like their family. It's not just a person coming through the door that's a tick on the you know, financial <laughs> metric for them or whatever. It's, it's literally, they, they care about the people and, and it's something, that, something they're gonna see again and again and again, and, and so they really do engage strongly with, with caring for them. Um, you know, solution for, you know, our solution, smart self-funding, independent TPA, obviously that's critical and we all know that, or at least most should know by, by now. Um, effective and transparent PBM solution, you've already kind of heard that. Um, and even, you know, even, we went through probably four, uh, we went through three PBMs and of those three PBMs that, PBMs that we went through, I thought each one was the best thing since the slice, since sliced bread, and as I've gone further down the road, I've understood more and more about what that whole marketplace is, and we've just continued to improve upon that. We were spending three quarters of a million dollars in 16, 17 on pharmacy, pharmacy drug, or drugs, um, and it got down to a quarter million. So that was the transformation in what we had by just managing that cost um, more effectively. Um, you know, high, contracts with high value providers, and that's actually 
I actually formed an LLC. So a school district forms an LLC and puts all these contracts in a bucket. That's what we did. Part of the reason we did that is I felt like, as a school district, we're, you know, we're more altruistic than maybe some, maybe, theoretically. But it was, it was the idea of having a bucket of contracts that could be shared at some point with somebody. Because why should the value only be ours? So that was, that was the start of that. Um, you know, we've got clinic provided care navigation. We used to, Ross used to be our care navigation. Kind of the same conversation that Jake had talked about is we transition to in-house care navigation because it's quite frankly more efficient um, and, and serves our members better rather than going outside, calling someone, coming back and so on. Um, no cost uh, for employees. You know, I say contracting with direct with um, systems and then reference-based pricing. So, you know, you'll hear a lot of, and you'll hear this, I mean, I, I've heard it a lot from brokers, um, from other employers, and we talk about it, you know, it's, it, this is hard, it doesn't work, it's complicated, uh, it's a big risk, and really it comes down to selecting the right people to work with and making that work. If you, got, if you have the right people at the table, it's going to work, um, and it's going to work well if you've got the right people involved. Um, and then, and that's, you know, this is another point. What does this slide tell you? It's, it's just the point being is it works, <laughs> you know, and that's really the point, uh, the short point that I want to make here. Um, and this is a slide that talks about cost of different systems. And then I think, um, I think uh, it was alluded to before talking about the various um, states and, and the cost of, of care in different locations and Wisconsin being one of the more expensive ones. This is from the RAND 5.0 study. Um, Wisconsin being about 330, and I actually just kind of took it off the graph. I, don't, I didn't have the actual data, so these are rough approximations. But, you know, why is it that Wisconsin's so danged expensive as compared to Arkansas? You know, um, I used to joke around, you know, um, you know, looking at Michigan, 190. Well, it's not Afghanistan for current, you know, it's, it's right next door. Why should it be that different? It doesn't make any sense. Um, and so, you know, more things just, why, why can't we make it better in Wisconsin? Why can't we make a difference? So if you look at this data over here, now this is a data set from our groups, for the employers that are working together, um, Ascension. And so it, it, I'm not saying this is perfect data. It's, it's a, small, a smaller data set, so understand that. Um, but look at Ascension, Theta, all that, you know, price, relative price. Um, if you look at uh, the RAND study, I think RAND indicated that Mayo and Aurora were like at the top of the, of the cost structure. So it may be something where we don't have a big enough sample. Um, but looking here, you got Mayo. Again, I believe this is a really light number because we actually cut Mayo out of our, now our out at least for our district, we cut, cut them out for the most part because we couldn't afford them. So there's a very little data there. Um, but you know, Rice Lake is in a very expensive place. That was my point in the slide. And yet we're having, you know, up until last year, we were spending under six, you know, sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars for a family plan in a really, really expensive market. Um, and then this slide, what does what does this what does this tell you? In my, you know, if you're looking at it, this is this is what happened, the transition that happened in our plan. So if you look, local health system, we we're in in basically ninety one percent of the care went to the the systems. And as we went out, we had a dramatic shift in the, in the usage. And what really this is, if you think about it, this is expensive care. This is much less expensive. It's the $25,000 knee as opposed to the you know, $60,000, $70,000 knee. So you're, a lot more actual volume of care is happening here than the percentages would indicate. Um, but obviously what it says is, you know, if you can steer to, to free market providers, if you can steer to... Um, providers that give you a reasonable price for the care, the, the financial transition is obvious, you know, in the benefits. And that is really steering to independence is what, what this slide indicates. Um, the next thing, what else does it tell you, though? In my mind, 50% of our care is still going to the system, and we need the systems. The reality is we still need the systems, and so we've got all this, this cost that's going there, we, we got, we've got the 330% problem still, no matter what we do. And if we're going to do anything about that, we have to kind of, I think, kind of have to act differently. Um, so what, what happened was Rice Lake Solution kind of 
for lack of a better term, metastasized and went out, uh, ended up really kind of taking off more in the Fox Valley and into um, the Milwaukee area. And effectively, the, we started out with a couple of employers. We hadn't formed the cooperative, but ultimately then did in, tw to the, um, in January, of, in uh, May of 22, we formed a cooperative um, with the idea that all these employers are working together and, and the, the intention or purpose of that is we want to basically push, get to a point where we have, an, have influence. And we're already seeing that happen to some degree where we, the people, you know, the systems know about us and they're going, you know, okay, well, is there something we can do? Can we work with you? And, for example, um, you know, even in our, in our conversations, you know, we, we work with HPS you know, with a lot of our groups, you know, it, it creates an opportunity for dialogue for them working with us, um, for, for the system, uh, working with systems. So really trying to get, organize our groups into a, or using our groups being organized into a, a, um, a, a, almost like a buying group, I think in the long run, if we can bring more employers together, um, however that looks, um, you know, we know the system's broken, we need to influence that. We've got a lot of things going on. If you think all the solutions that are out there, you know, all the, you know, when we started, there were hardly any solutions that existed, you know, to, to improve situations. You know, even the P PBM solutions. You know, there's a lot of things that have changed. But what I think ultimately needs to happen, in my opinion, is we need to have an employer voice. We don't really exercise our voice. I don't think very well. We've got all these different employers. They're buying their, their health care in different ways all over the place, and ultimately the systems win because, for the most part, they, they, don't, have to, they don't have to deal with us. But we, we realistically, um, if, if you put all the money that um, employers spend together, it's more than Medicare individually, more than Medicaid individually. You know, we have a huge voice, and it's the most profitable um, spend that... Um, hospitals actually get. So if we can influence that, if we can use that leverage, I think over time, if, if we get together, um, and it doesn't, you know, multiple different ways, you know, that can happen multiple different ways, but if we can influence the marketplace, I think ultimately we can start to push back on systems and get that 50% addressed. Um, so, you know, uniting employers, forcing disruption, I think we have to think about more about, you know, having access to all providers, in my mind, it, or all, you know, all systems, because the reality is then there isn't, uh, there's not a lot of incentive for a system to change their pricing because I'm gonna get some of it anyway. Um, supporting political advocacy, you know, and this is obviously the reason why. We've got Wisconsin that's really expensive. Can we get it back to the, to the Arkansas price range? So, um, and this is the EHCW kind of a, a, a the story behind, or I guess what we're effectively working on together is, is the group. So um, it's a group cooperative, multiple employers working together, consumer-driven plans, um, contracting for high, uh, high quality care, as we know. Um, basically, the, the idea is we're not trying to force anyone into any one thing, but anyone that's with us has really got to be functioning in a, in a consumer-driven model. In, in working in that respect. Um, you know, and then we were working together to access solutions that you couldn't really get individually, um, and then just advocating for better things, better even political policy stuff. We were actually uh, testifying on the white bagging issue, trying to get that to be uh, taken over, so. Um, and I think that's it. Wow, I didn't even know that part was. So the EHCW Cooperative, that's, that's where I'm at now, so that's what we've been doing. Thank you.